desire to worship you and to serve you as our majesty. And we just thank you, Lord, that you give us the privilege to do that. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to be seated? I can just about see everyone for the trees. But uh, I don't know if you was here two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago. maybe may have been three weeks ago. Andy pointed out the art in our windows that had been done by our local school. Um, in the first window, we had the Homer Simpson angel. Um, in the second window, we'd got these very strange shepherds. And the third window, we'd got sort of a black-eyed Mary don't know what's happened to her. Perhaps she fell off the donkey on the way to Bethlehem, but who knows? And it must have been a pretty rough road, mustn't it? Pretty rough um, time traveling, um, heavily pregnant. So just think about that. Uh, we laugh at our sort of nativities and when we see the children sharing those nativities with us. Uh, but there's a serious side to it, isn't there? Um, in this last window here, we've got these three kings. Um, the three wise men, the magi, call them what you want. But that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about these people. Um, they came with hearts wanting to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And today we're launching into a new sermon series um, called The Gift. It's all about the gift. And isn't Jesus a gift to us? Isn't His Holy Spirit a gift to us? So after the next uh, three weeks, that's what we want to do. We want to talk about these three elements of the gifts that was brought to Jesus. And uh, that was brought to Jesus by apparently these three wise guys. Uh, we read about it in chapter 2 of Matthew's Gospel. So let me just give you a little bit of context to the Gospel uh, for those of you who don't really know the story. If you do know the story, or if you don't, it's nice to be reminded of it, isn't it? Um, Jesus was born at a time when King Herod was obviously the king. And it says that these wise men, or I call them magi, traveled a great distance to come and worship Jesus. Now, question for you. How many wise men were there? Three. Well, how many, is, how many people have got a nativity scene at home? Have you got a nativity scene at home? Yeah, you've got one. You've got one. So you've got one. We've got a couple in church. There's one up at the front under the table. And it's tradition that we see in that nativity scene, we see three wise men, don't we? Uh, but how many were there? I heard a shout from the back that says, we don't really know. And that's the truth, isn't it? We don't really know how many they were, but tradition tells us that there were probably three. And you wonder why. Why does tradition tell us that there were probably three? Because they brought three gifts. So there's three recorded gifts in the gospel. But the one thing that we do know is that these guys were desperate you know when you're really desperate to do something in your life? I don't know what that might be, but sometimes you get really desperate to do something. And these, to eat. You might have a real bit desperate to go to McDonald's, might you? Really, really desperate. And keep giving mum a nudge and say, you know, after he's finished talking, that's where we could go. A Mike Flurry, that's what he wants. I think if we, you know, when this goes out online... Um, we should get some um, money for advertising, shouldn't we? Mike Flurry's at McDonald's. I hope they're listening this morning. Anyway, whether you're desperate for a Mike Flurry or whether you're desperate for whatever you're desperate for, these guys were really desperate to worship this king that, um, that they were anticipating was going to be born, the savior of the world. Scripture tells us that they saw a star and they knew distinctly when they saw the star, Matthew 2, verse 10, it says they were filled with joy. I'm sure you'll be filled with joy when you get your mic flurry, but never mind. They were filled with joy, and it says, as they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. 
it says, Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I don't know how many of you have had children, but uh, what sort of gifts are those? You know, for newborn children, gold. Well, that's all right, isn't it? Gold's all right. Let's, let's bring it on. Let's have some gold. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You normally get sort of socks and baby grows. Now, I know a little bit about this now because I think you know that Justine's expecting a baby in March. And as we go out shopping, you know, you even go into Asda. And I go into Asda. I go through the little gates that open automatically and I go straight along. And Michelle just veers off to the right. And that's where the baby clothes are. And she's going, oh, look at this. And it's in pink. And Justine says, don't buy pink. I know I'm having a girl, but I don't want pink. Anyway, Justine, if you're listening, you've got some pink stuff. <laughs> she, she might be thinking, I'll settle for the gold. <laughs> but, you know, um, these gifts, although the baby grows and the socks are really practical, in the time of Jesus when he was born, the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh were really helpful to what was going to happen in the future. And as well as that, they were deeply spiritual. You know, when we think about what those three gifts meant, and I think this is more about what they meant because there'd probably be lots of other gifts that were given, but in the Gospels we hear about the three gifts because they've got a real spiritual meaning. Frankincense to represent Jesus as the high priest. Myrrh to represent that Jesus was going to be a suffering servant. But today I want to talk about that thing that um, all made you smile, gold. Um, gold throughout history has been talked about as a gift fit for a king. And uh, it is fit for a king, isn't it? It's fit for our King Jesus. And people think that it's a, go a, a gift fit for a king because it's expensive. And who more worth it? than to give it to Jesus and to give it to his family. So Jesus as king, um, that's what we should be thinking about this morning. I wonder, is anybody in the mood to play a little game as we think about kings this morning? I know I've got one young man here that's interested in playing a game. Everybody else seems to be quite tired this morning. But anyway, we'll play the game, us two. All right, are you ready? First picture up on the screen. Who do we think this is? The Lion King. Do we know, has he got a name? Simba. Yes, yeah, Simba from the Lion King. What about the next one? King Kong. I don't know who the guy is at the back, but he looks a bit fierce. But King Kong. What, next one. No, not McDonald's. Yeah, but I think it's a Whopper, actually, isn't it? But we get it from Burger King, so... If there's a big queue outside McDonald's, you could always go to Burger King. I don't know whether there's a Burger King around here, but never. Sorry? There's one in the Broadway. Craig knows exactly where Burger King is. You know, last week it was, um, we were talking about Greg's. This week it's Burger King and McDonald's. So we've got some food thing going on here. I think today it might be a hot roast sandwich next door. Pork sandwich today. I was pulling pork at 11 o'clock last night. So there we go. It's all ready for you. Next one. Who's this? Stephen King. I can tell the people that read books and then turn to the back to see, you know, the picture of the author. Will you get the next one? Who's this? Oh, do you know, I thought nobody would get this. So I, I thought I'm going to have to put another picture on to show when she were a little bit younger so that you'd actually get this. But you seem to be all getting it this morning. Last one. B.B. King, yeah. So all kings, you know, we think about kings, don't we? Um, some, think, some think about our stomachs, but some people think about kings. So today I want to talk about the kingship of Jesus um, and the magi that brought in that goal to represent that. So we're going to talk about a king who is like no other. You know, Jesus is not just a person born on earth, but he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of Lords. And in Christian circles, we talk about that quite often. We say, oh, he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
But what does it really mean? That's what we should be thinking about. What does it really mean? In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said this in 1 Timothy 6.15. He says, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessing and almighty God. Revealed from heaven. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, when Paul said this, he wrote it in the Greek language, and it was impossible to state it any more powerfully. You know, when he said he was the King of kings, he really meant that he was the King of kings. And there's no other way that he could have put any more emphasis on it, because this is who he is. You know, the supreme authority, the one that's over all the kingdoms of the earth. You know, the entire cosmos is in the hands of of our King Jesus. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but people were expecting a Messiah. They were expecting a Savior. They were expecting a King to be born, but the way that the King was born was different than what they were expecting. You know, they were expecting a King to be born in a palace, you know, surrounded by wealth, surrounded by luxury, surrounded by comfort, you know, in our day and age, a, a king that was born would be born in a palace, probably born in a purple lined crib, probably got a Gucci onesie. I don't know. Michelle's not bought any Gucci onesies, just, just George ones from Asda. But no one expected our king to be born into poverty. Nobody expected him to be born in, we don't really know what it was like, you know, in a cave whatever, next to farm animals. That's what we portray, isn't it, in our nativity scenes. We see the, the sheep and the goats and the, the other cattle. But how smelly. You know, if you've been in the stable here, we've just got some straw in there. We've got no animals. I think they've all disappeared, but it smells. It doesn't smell very favorable. But that is where our King Jesus was born. You know, the Messiah born to a joiner or a carpenter, as uh, some people say, born in a place called Nazareth. And you know, later on in the Gospels, Nathaniel, one of the people that's mentioned in the Gospels, says, could anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, it definitely did, didn't it? No one predicted that the King of glory, the Son of God, would befriend people like prostitutes. Nobody would expect that He would touch lepers and love those people that the religious people just pushed to one side. They never imagined that a king would choose uneducated people. You know, he chooses people like me. He chooses people like you. That's who he is. He chose fishermen, despised tax collectors. That's who he chose. He did not despise them, but other people did. But he welcomed tax collectors. He welcomed the prostitutes. He welcomed those fishermen. And he made them his disciples. And he welcomed the rebellious troublemakers. No one ever imagined that our king would forgive a woman caught in adultery. But he did. You know, she was ready to be stoned to death, and he steps in. You know, and in our lives, sometimes we feel like we've been stoned, you know, not literally, but metaphorically. And Jesus can step in if we want Him to step in, and that's the key thing, wanting Him to step in. He confronted the hypocrites. He overturned the tables when the temple was misused. And you might say, well, we've got a Christmas shop at the back of church. Well, if you've got a problem with that, come and have a chat with me and I'll explain the difference. Because there is a difference. There's a distinctive difference of what we are doing it for. We don't want you to change your money into St. James money before you exchange it with our people in the shop. So, there is a distinctive difference. You know, who would have ever imagined that Jesus would have then rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? You know, and those people that were cheering him when he came into Jerusalem would be the outcasts and the ones that was overlooked by the other people. And no one would have expected that a king would stand trial for the crimes that he didn't commit. 
No one would have imagined that the innocent king would be beaten, whipped, stripped naked, and left to hang on an instrument of torture. But that's what happened to him. No one would have ever imagined that the creator of the world would have been hanging on a cross as people spitted at him and mocked him. And no one would have ever imagined that the creator of the world would have looked up to heaven at that point in his future life and say, Father, forgive them because they don't really know what they're doing. When they offered him a drink to dull the pain, he rejected it, facing the full agony of death on a cross. And then he looked up to heaven and he said to his father, it is finished. Some people take that the wrong way, that it was the end and Jesus had just died and he couldn't do any more. Well, he'd done what he was sent to do by his father. He'd done everything that his father asked him to do. Into your hands, he says, I commit my life. No one ever expected that the king would die a shameful death in front of all those mocking people. And when he breathed his last, there was no one predicting that the sky would turn dark and the earth would shake, but it did. And the world would leave, lose what they thought was the hope, but they didn't know that three days later he was going to come back to life and then give us the true hope that we have today. No one would have expected that. But this king, our king, is a risen king, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. He intercedes for us, and I want to tell you about a king like no other kings. You might think this is a bit of an unusual kickoff to our Christmas sort of series as we start to talk about King Jesus, but we have an unusual king. We have a king like no other. What's interesting to me is when we look back at the story in the first century, we see some very distinctive responses to this king, the King Jesus. And oddly enough, 2,000 years later, we see the same sort of responses. The first one is, who represents King Herod in our days? You know, this story is about a king that was opposed by King Herod. But there are so many people in our world today that oppose King Jesus. You know, King Herod sent out a decree, didn't he? We read about it in our Christmas, our Christmas stories that he sent a decree out saying, I want you to kill all the boys under the age of two because he wanted to make sure that Jesus would not live. That leads us to wonder, one, the actual three wise guys did turn up. Was it at the point or was it later? But does it really matter? The fact is they turned up anyway. And we can think about that. You know, there's lots of people today that say, I don't need religion. I don't need that kind of God stuff in my life. I don't need the Jesus stuff. I'm doing fine on my own. But when we look at those people, are they really doing fine on their own? Are you doing fine on your own? Some people say, I don't want anyone telling me what to do. Well, Jesus gives us free will, but when we fail, He's there to catch us. Some people say, I'm going to do life my way. How many times at funerals, Gloria's laughing, how many times at funerals have we heard that song? Frank Sinatra, I've done it my way. It's like it used to be the most popular song at funerals because people like to say, I've done it my way. But you know, when people have done it their way and things have failed, we do know that we can call out to this king and he's there, he's ready and he's waiting and he's willing to help us. Secondly, I think that something is quite common today and that thing is that, you know, we had the Jewish priests and they opposed Jesus and they just dismissed him as king. But what the bizarre thing is that the Scriptures were, were always being read by those people, by those Jews. They were always reading the Scriptures. And the Scriptures said in Micah 5, 2, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So these people that used to read the ancient text, they were the ones that dismissed him. 
And today the same sort of thing happens, doesn't it? We ask people, do you want to come to church? Do you want to experience the presence of God? No. Would you like to read God's living word? Not really. Would you like to be part of a mission sharing God's love with a broken world? And some people say, no, that's not for me. And that's just the people in the church. So what about the people outside? You know, I remember being on placement at a place called Lanchester, and it's, uh, it's not far from Durham. We was there for about six months, and um, I got told by somebody there that they preached two things, you know. This guy said, I said, you know, how long do you preach for, and what, sh what should I do, and so forth. I weren't too sure what to do, and he, he said, oh, just just, just preach two things. And I says, what? He says, we preach the gospel and we preach five minutes. <laughs> I said, all right. That place was, st it was steeped in ritual. It was a very ritualistic place. You know, we got quite friendly with one of the lay readers. We went to, um, I think we went to the house for something to eat one evening. And, um, what was he called? John. Anyway, John. And, um, uh, one day, he was uh, sitting with us, and it got to sort of five to ten, and he says, oh, I must go. I said, where are you going? You're not on the rotor to do anything today. He said, I've got to robe up. I says, what are you robing up for? He says, because I always robe up. But I said, but you're not doing anything. But it was a very ritualistic place. But the thing is, places like that quite often, and I'm not saying all places like that, but it was steeped in ritual, but it, it knew sort of the head knowledge about Jesus, but it didn't know the heart knowledge about Him. You know, they dismissed, really, Jesus as King, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You know, when it comes to the works of the Holy Spirit, I think that would be a place. I never asked at the time, but I've just got the impression that it's, we don't do that sort of thing here. Well, it's not them that do it, it's the Spirit that does it, but you've got to invite the Spirit to come in. And when we think about people coming in, those wise men, Magi, call them what you want, you know, when they entered into that place where Jesus was, whether he was a baby or whether he was two years old at the time, we don't really know, but the fact is they bowed down and they worshipped him. They'd got the head knowledge, but they also had the heart knowledge. They wanted to worship him for who he was. The ultimate response to show reverence and honor to God was to bow down to him. In other words, they said, it's not about me. It's not about our thrones, the three of them. It's about our desires, our wants and our desires. It's all about you. They bowed down and they worshipped him. So I'm curious this morning what our response would be. You know, some people think that this is just a good story or is Jesus the king of your heart? That's the true question, isn't it? Is he the king of your heart? You know, within everything within me wants you to say that he is the king of your heart. That's what I would really desire this morning for whether you're in the building, whether you're at home, whether you're watching online, that you just say, look, I just want King Jesus to be the king of my heart. I want him to lead me where he wants me to be. I want him to guide me in the things that I should be doing. You know, when I was young, um, our family was not a church-going family. My gran, my nan, as I used to call her, I think she started going to church when she was about 50. The family knew about God. My mum knew the stories from the Bible. We come back to that head knowledge, but not the heart knowledge. And, um, but I want you to have the heart knowledge today. Quite often we find at Christmas time, we find a lot of CEO Christians. You know, are you a CEO Christian? Maybe not the people in here, but the people who are at home. Are you a CEO Christian? Are you a Christmas and Easter only? Not the chief executive officer, but are you a Christmas and Easter only Christian? 
But really, we should be saying, no, I'm a Christian full stop. That's who I want you to be. I'm a person who is on the way to knowing him more and more each and every day. You know, for a lot of people, church is just a lot of religious stuff that goes on. It's about ritual and historic stories. But there's something that keeps people coming back at Christmas and at Easter. And that something is a king who stripped himself of the glory of heaven, was born of a virgin in poverty, and reached out to the lowest of the law. And in our context today, that's those people that just can't get it right. You know, those people who are financially stuck. Those people who can't get through the day without a drink. And that's the type of people that Jesus came to save. Jesus came to save people like me, and he came to serve and to save people like you. This is the King Jesus that I worship. So just for a moment, let me tell you about this King Jesus. He's not some distant, angry, uninvolved judge waiting for you to mess up life. He's not just the guy that lives upstairs, the big guy in the sky, as some people call him. He's not just your eight pound, six ounce newborn baby. He's the righteous King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In fact, if you're willing and able, can you just uh, stand? I think it'd be good if we just stood together this morning. And let's just give reference and reverence to this King who became one of us. The one who gave his life for us. Let's just take a moment to prepare our hearts to worship him again. To give him honor. To give him reverence for who he is. Because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one that gives us life. You know, my king, according to scripture, is the king of glory. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of all ages. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus is the King that heals the sick. He opens the blind eyes. And He opens deaf ears. He strengthens the weak and delivers the captive. He resolves those who are broken and hurting because He is the King. He's a shelter in our time of trouble. He's a light when our world is dark. He's the Prince of Peace and the Lamb of God, the Alpha and the Omega. He's the resurrection and the life because He is our King. His goodness is indescribable. His power is incomprehensible. His grace is irresistible. In His name, when the people hear it, darkness just trembles. In His presence, demons flee. The devil could not stop Him and death could not defeat Him. You know, the great could not hold him because Jesus is the King. And I want you this morning to know him better than you have ever known him before. You know, perhaps in some way at this moment in time in your life, something is breaking through in your heart. And you just can't oppose it. You just can't dismiss it and you can't dismiss him because you see him now for who he is. And if that's you, you need to revere him. You need to honor him. You need to praise him. Father, we worship you as our true king, the supreme real ruler of the universe. Not just a king who reigns, but a king who is full of love and full of grace. Not just one that came to rule, but one who came to die that, so that we could have life and have a relationship with you. If you've not already done so, you just might want to close your eyes for a moment. You might want to put out your hands in front of you just as a, a way of receiving the Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we want to be all about you this morning. 
We want to be focused on you. We want to worship you. We want to honor you. We want to reflect your glory. We want to reflect your grace and your goodness. And we want to reflect your unconditional love for us. What I want to do is just encourage you to keep praying this morning. We're going to worship. We're going to sing a song together. And this is sort of your opportunity. You can either stay and continue to worship because we're going to worship for a while. Or you can go off and have a coffee next door. But this, so this is the sort of this is just your time. Just do what you want to do this morning.
Your presence is alive. 